for chapter 15, part two, we are going to be talking about the different pathways that can get a little bit confusing. So as we go through this, I encourage you to pause it as many times as needed and make sure that you do have out your spinal cord drawing so that you can add a few things onto that as we go through and we learn about all of the particular pathways, their names, their directions, etc. So today we're going to talk about the three different somatosensory pathways. This is going to carry the sensory information from the skin and muscles of the body wall, the head, the neck, and then the limbs to the central nervous system. The names of the three you see there in colors, and this is color coded to kind of help you with remembering what information goes to each individual pathway. So anytime I reference the spinal thalamic pathway, you will see that there will be red, the posterior column pathway, that should be green, and then the spinal cerebellar pathway is that purple. Now, whenever you're looking at these pathways, the words, if you break them down, will tell you kind of where they're going or where they may be located. So for instance, for the spinal thalamic, then we know that this is going to be an ascending pathway because it's going from the spine up to the thalamus and the brain. The posterior column pathway is obviously going to be the pathway that's going to run in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, which you'll see in just a minute. And then the spinal cerebellar pathway, same thing, ascending from the spine up to the cerebellum. So on your spinal cord drawing, what you can do is you can now add in the names to these specific pathways. Obviously, you can see the posterior column pathway is going to be on your posterior aspect of your spinal cord. So the posterior column pathway, you want to draw in where we had originally labeled that dorsal white column or that dorsal funiculus. Whatever you had previously named it, now you can go in and be more specific. And what you can see here is we have the gracile fasciculus in this area that's going to be more medial, okay? And that is closer to that posterior median sulcus. Whereas the cuneate fasciculus is going to be more on the lateral aspect of that column. For the spinal cerebellar pathway, you can see that we have two as well here. So we have posterior, obviously more towards the back of the cord, and then anterior is going to be on the ventral aspect of the cord. So these are, of course, bilateral. So you can see it's going to be on the left side as well as the right side the posterior and the anterior spinocerebellar tract. And then lastly, we have the spinothalamic pathway. Your lateral pathway is going to be in the lateral column. And then the anterior pathway is, of course, going to be in the anterior column. So draw those in on your spinal cord drawing so that you are aware of where each of these pathways one very important thing to note whenever we're talking about these pathways, we're going to be using terms like first order, second order, third order neurons. And you will see on some of the pictures there will be a key that will represent which is the first, second, or third order neuron. So make sure that you do understand that whenever we're talking about a first order neuron, this is the neuron that will deliver the sensations to the central nervous system. So it is the first one in line. Remember, anytime we're talking about sensory information, we have to start with some sort of stimulus at a receptor cell. So that stimulus at the receptor cell is going to potentially give us some action potentials so that we can have some sort of sensations delivered to our central nervous system. Whenever we're looking at the central nervous system, remember that means spinal cord and brain, so we're going to be talking about the deeper levels of where in the spinal cord and where in the brain. But it all has to start with this first order neuron delivering that sensation to the spinal cord or the brain. The cell body of a first order neuron is going to be either in a spinal ganglion, 
So this would be the dorsal root ganglion that you have drawn on your picture or the cranial nerve ganglion. And remember, ganglion just means a group of cell bodies. So we've already seen the spinal ganglion and we'll be looking at some cranial nerve ganglions a little later on. The second order neuron is going to be that interneuron. So the in-between part, the interneuron in either the spinal cord or the brainstem that is going to receive information from the first guy. So this is going to be very important that you take note of the fact that the second order neuron will be the one that will do the crossing over to the opposite side of the central nervous system. Remember, crossing over means decusation. So that's the term that we'll be using. Make sure that you are very familiar with that term, decusation, because you will see it in different places depending upon the pathway that we are discussing. And then finally, the third order neuron. The important thing to remember about this is that this is how we are going to be aware of these particular sensations. So if we have a third order neuron, that means we will receive the conscious awareness. We will have the perception of the sensation if there is a third order neuron involved. For our sensory homunculus, this is new information, and what I want you to see from this is that this is a functional mapping of the primary somatosensory cortex. Remember, the primary somatosensory cortex is located in the postcentral gyrus of the brain within the parietal lobe. You will see on this postcentral gyrus, kind of like what you see here on the medial side, there's going to be specific areas along this entire gyrus for specific body parts. So everything is very ordered and organized. None of this is willy-nilly. So if some sort of sensory information is going to come from the foot, it will come into the medial aspect of the postcentral gyrus. Whereas if it's going to say from the teeth or from the gums, you can see here that it's going to be more on the lateral aspect of the postcentral gyrus. All of these structures have different sizes because the area devoted to a particular body region is proportional to the density of sensory neurons for that region of the body. It is not proportional to the region size. So when we're looking at the back, although the back may be very large on an individual, there is not going to be a large portion of the postcentral gyrus or the somatosensory cortex devoted to the back because it's not about the body's size. It is about the density of the sensory neurons in particular areas of the body. So if we look at this picture here, these two different pictures basically show if we were to put this in regards to a man, what would the somatosensory cortex look like if we had this figure representing the different areas of the somatosensory cortex with a higher receptor density for different body structures. As you can see here, the hands are incredibly large. So that means that there's a lot of receptor density on our hands, but look at how little these elbows are, or look at how little the shoulders are. Very, very small as compared to the hands. You can also see the lips and the tongue are very big as well. If you've ever unfortunately been stung by a bee in your lip, you know that that is one of the worst feelings that actually happened to my husband. He got stung by a bee in his lip and it was very painful. Although he has been stung by a bee in multiple other body parts, he did report that that was indeed the most painful bee sting experience he's ever had. Now, that is because there are so many sensory receptors in the lips, so it caused a much higher intensity of pain because of that. 
All right, so let's start with our first track, the spinothalamic pathway. And again, remember the color code, so this information you will see in red. So for our spinothalamic pathway, remember we have two tracks we have to discuss, the anterior as well as the lateral. When we're talking about the anterior pathway, this is going to carry sensations of crude touch and pressure, whereas the lateral is going to carry sensations of pain and temperature. As I discussed last class, this information will be carried via the type A and C fibers through this particular pathway. The first order neurons are going to come into the spinal cord and remember they synapse within the posterior horns. That's because our posterior horns are going to be where we have all of our sensory information coming in. The second order neurons are going to cross to the opposite side. Remember the decussation. So they're going to cross to the opposite side of the spinal cord in the white commissure before ascending towards the brain. The white commissure, remember commissure is kind of like a bridge. So the white commissure is going to be that particular area where we can have crossing over of our particular tracks. Now, important to note, you want to make sure you highlight that that second order neuron within the spinothalamic pathway crosses before ascending. Okay, that's why I bolded those words. It's very important you remember before ascending, there will be a crossing over. And then once it goes through its ascension, the third order neurons in the ventral nuclei of the thalamus are going to then send that sensation over to the primary somatosensory cortex. If we take a recall from whenever we talked about the thalamus in the brain, remember the thalamus has multiple different nuclei. So in this particular case, we're talking specifically about the ventral nuclei. And you can see on this graph here, that the ventral nuclei will project that sensory information to the primary sensory cortex. So, important to note, as I put up at the top, the right side of the thalamus receives sensory information from the left side of the body. Left side of the thalamus receives sensory information from the right side. That's because of the decusation that had occurred. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about where it's coming from versus where it is going. Because of the crossing over, right side thalamus receives sensory information. So here's picture view for those of you who prefer pictures. Again, you can see that general sensory input coming into the ventral nuclei of the thalamus. And remember, the thalamus will then project that information on to that postcentral gyrus for that somatosensory cortex. So here is the complete picture. Now, whenever we're looking at this particular picture, what you need to take note of is this is the anterior tract. So on the anterior tract, remember we're carrying crude touch and pressure. So what we can see here, here's our key that I referenced a little bit earlier. The first order neuron will be represented in red, the second order will be represented in white, and then our third order will be represented in black. So let's start from the very beginning. If we look here, here's where we're starting, okay? Crude touch and press pressure sensations from the right side of the body. First order neuron is going to carry that information into the dorsal root. You can see the dorsal root ganglion right here, which is where the cell body will be. That information will be, get, be carried into the posterior horn. So you can see within the posterior horn, remember the horns are our butterfly. Within the posterior horn, there is going to be a synapse. And the first order is going to communicate with the second order neuron. Immediately, that second order neuron is going to decussate. So you see it going from the right side over to the left side. After the decussation, then comes the ascension. 
So it's going to start to go up, 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 up. And then now look, we are in the brainstem. Specifically, this is labeled the medulla oblongata. If we continue superiorly, now we are in the midbrain. Okay, so you've already learned your brainstem, so you know the different components to it. We continue to ascend beyond the brainstem and now get into the ventral nuclei of the thalamus. This is where the synapse is going to occur with that third order neuron. So we can see that the arrow has changed color from white to black. And the third order neuron is gonna carry the information from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory cortex. In this particular case, what you can see is that it is now landing the primary somatosensory cortex area of the fingers. So whatever the stimulation was from the very beginning right here had to have been from a finger. It wasn't from the face. It wasn't from the foot. It was from a finger because this is where the thalamus is now sending the information. If it was from, let's say, the tongue, then the information would be carried to this particular part of the somatosensory cortex, which represents the tongue. Because remember, there's great organization here. So how we perceive, remember perception is all about whether or not that third order neuron sends information to the primary somatosensory cortex. So how we perceive an arriving stimulus, whether as painful, cold, hot, or vibrating, depends on which second order and third order neurons are stimulated. So the brain can be very specific to let you know specifically what is going on. The ability to connect that stimulus with a specific location or to localize the sensation, meaning is it on the finger, is it on the face, is it on the foot, that all depends on the projection of information from the thalamus to the specific area of that somatosensory cortex, okay? So perception and localization all depend upon our second and third order neurons. Now let's take a look at the lateral spinal thalamic tract. This is going to be very similar. But we know for lateral, now what we're going to be carrying is pain and temperature. The anterior was crude touch and pressure. This is now pain and temperature. But we have the very same setup, whereas red represents our first order, white represents the second order, and black represents the third order. We have the exact same setup where we're going to have the information run through the dorsal root, we're going to have the synapse in the posterior horn, an immediate decussation through the white commissure, an ascension up through the entire brainstem headed towards the ventral nuclei of the thalamus, where it will synapse with the third order, send information over into the primary somatosensory cortex. So it all is the same setup because the, both of them are spinal thalamic tracts. Both of them go from the spine to the thalamus, and both of them have the decussation immediately in the spinal cord level before the ascension. The difference is one is going to carry pain and temperature, which is the lateral. The other one is going to carry the crude touch and pressure, which is going to be the anterior. So let's take a look at this. If we're talking about the lateral spinal thalamic tract, if there is a lesion, if something has happened, giving us some sort of pathology, then is this true or false? If we have a lesion on the right side of the spinal cord, okay? Right side of the spinal cord in our spinothalamic tract. Are we going to have a problem with contralateral loss of pain and temperature? Well, we know the lateral is associated with pain and temperature, so really the question is just about is it going to be something that is showing up on the same side of the body as the lesion is or on the opposite side of the body as the lesion is? 
if we have a, a lesion on the right side of the spinal cord, does that give us a problem in the left leg? Because we're at L1. Okay, so take note of that, L1. True or false? This is true because what we have here is the immediate decussation for our tract. So even though the lesion is on the right side, there's an immediate decussation, which means we're going to have the problem on the opposite leg. So that's what contralateral means. We have a lesion on the right, shows up as an issue on the left. So that is contralateral and it would be loss of pain and temperature because that is the information that's carried in the lateral spinal thalamic tract. So yes, that is true. Now there can be some abnormalities in the spinal thalamic pathways. So we're going to talk about two in particular. The first one is phantom limb syndrome. This is where we'll have painful sens sensations that are not produced where they are perceived to originate. So in phantom limb syndrome, if someone has an amputation of their limb, then they can have continued feeling of pain in that limb even though it is no longer there. The reason why is because the neurons involved were once part of the labeled line that monitored conditions in the intact limbs. So if you remember from last class, we talked about labeled lines and how sensory information is carried through particular labeled lines to different parts of the central nervous system. That is still programmed within that particular person. So they can still feel issues even though the limb is gone which is one of the abnormalities of the spinal thalamic pathway. Another one is what we call referred pain. Referred pain means that we have pain in an area of the body that actually is coming from somewhere else. So the pain is originating in a specific part of the body, usually an organ, and you feel that pain on a different area aspect of your body, not necessarily where that particular organ is. So if you look at this first one here, you can see, yes, the liver and the gallbladder do sit in the right hypochondriac region. You could get some pain right there, but you can also get the pain referring to your right shoulder as well as to the right scapular area. I'll show you a picture of the posterior uh, referral pain patterns here in just a second. So the pain is not just going to be just in this one spot. It can go up towards the shoulder. A lot of people are familiar with the referral pain pattern of a heart attack. And that's because many people know that that's one of the things to uh, make sure and pay attention to. In clinical practice, if someone complains of pain down the left arm or pain that goes up into the left side of the neck and then they also have shortness of breath or some other symptom of a heart attack, um, tight chest pains, etc. then that's whenever we need to be very quick about addressing that particular patient's condition because it could indeed be that referral pain pattern from the heart to a different part of the body. Whenever you're looking at this girl down here, you can see there's different areas in the abdominal pelvic cavity that can cause referral pain patterns. And then you can also see on this male for the ureters, the pain can come from the back and go around and go into the groin area as well. So let's take a look at the posterior portion as well. So now you can see here, this is a little bit more detailed whenever we're looking at different referral pain patterns. Um, as I said earlier, for that liver and gallbladder, you can see back here in the right scapular area. Um, sometimes it will project in this particular area as well. As a chiropractor, if I have somebody who comes in complaining of pain in this part of their back, and I palpate and I find that they do not have any subluxations in that area. They don't necessarily need to be adjusted in that area. 
my very next question is going to be, what have you eaten in the last 24 to 48 hours? And I am listening for anything that is high in fat, whether that's good fat or whether that's bad fat. And the reason for that is because the gallbladder will help break down and emulsify fat. So if that person is eating things that are really unhealthy, like hamburger, french fries, milkshake, or if that person is trying to do a new keto diet, they just started and they're transitioning to really, really high fat foods, um, their gallbladder may react negatively. It may cause some inflammation in the gallbladder as it cannot keep up with all of the fat that is coming through their digestive system. So it may cause this referral pain pattern to this particular portion of the back. So of course we you know, troubleshoot from there. Now, whenever you're looking at the kidney on this particular uh, chart, what you can see is there is a law hut of the area of the lower body covered by referral pain patterns from the kidneys. So sometimes they just cause pain in the low back area. If it is something like um, a kidney infection, the kidney punch test may be able to identify this. Um, if they are indeed having some um, urine smell or something else that is concerning to them, then that can be another clue that this may be something going on with the kidneys. So if the pain kind of comes off and on, um, it's sporadic, that can be another clue as well. There's multiple different clues whenever it comes to these different pain patterns for the body, um, but for sure the kidneys generally do wrap around from the back and go towards the front of the body as well. Now the other thing to take note of is of course the appendix, because if the appendix is having a problem, um, that person may end up with a burst appendix, in which case that is emergency surgery. So we do want to be very aware of anybody who has that right uh, lower quadrant pain because the appendix may be to blame for that. So especially if there is a fever and or vomiting involved with that very intense pain in that right lower quadrant, then that's an uh, emergency situation that we want to address immediately. So as you can see, multiple different Organs can emit pain signals to particular parts of the body. We want to make sure we're aware of those so that we can evaluate and not just necessarily always term something as, oh, well, that's back pain or that's shoulder tension because it could indeed be something else on a deeper level that needs to be further addressed. Now, we do have various terms that will indicate the degree of sensitivity in an area, so make sure you know the difference in these three terms. Anesthesia, remember if we put something with the prefix of an A, A means none or without. So anesthesia is a total loss of sensation, okay? Total loss. That person does not have the ability to feel either the touch, the pressure, pain, or temperature sensations in a particular area of their body. Hypo means below. So they will still have some feeling, it will just be a decrease in the feeling. Not a total loss, because that would be anesthesia, but a decrease is hypoesthesia. And then paresthesia is abnormal sensations. So paresthesia means that the sensations don't come through as they normally are supposed to. Um, things feel a little bit different, as in whenever your leg falls asleep, if you've been sitting the wrong way, or if your arm falls asleep, if you were sleeping the wrong way throughout the night, you're putting pressure on that nerve, you may feel some of that um, tingling, numbing sensation. So make sure you are aware of the difference in these three different words because they all represent a different degree of sensitivity in an area for a person's body. All right, so quick review. Let's make sure that you are good on the information that we have discussed so far. So when we're talking about the pathway that detects sensations of pain and temperature, what would you call that pathway? 
Think about it for a second. The lateral spinal thalamic tract is the one that is going to sense pain and temperature. Okay. Could you fill in the blank? The anterior spinal thalamic tract sense what and what? So your answer should be crude touch and pressure. So fill in that blank. Feeling pain in an uninjured part of the body when pain originates at another location is known as what did we say that we would call this if we have pain that is coming to an area that is not hurt, but it is from an area that is suffering? This is our referred pain. Okay, so we're referring the pain from an area that is hurt to an area that is not. An example of this is, and you can fill in the blank with any of those examples, so it could have been the pain of a heart attack going down the left arm or up the left neck. It could be the gallbladder referring pain to the right shoulder or to the right scapular area. Any of those you can fill in the blank with the example of the referral pain pattern. And then could you answer the difference in anesthesia and paresthesia or paresthesia and hyposthesia? So making sure that you're familiar with those particular vocabulary words and knowing the difference between all three is going to be important. All right, so now that we have discussed our spinal thalamic pathway, let's go into the next one, which is going to be the posterior column pathway. So we're moving away from the red and we're going into the green. Whenever you're looking at the posterior column, the gracile fasciculus actually means slender, whereas cuneate fasciculus means wedge shape. So if that helps you with remembering which one is more medial versus more lateral, then by all means feel free to use that. In talking about the posterior columns, we're going to be looking at the sensations of fine touch vibration, pressure, and proprioception. If you do not remember what proprioception is, go back and review the information from the last class where we talked about the proprioception. So of course for the posterior column pathway, we just saw that the spinal tracts involved are the left and right gracile fasciculus and the left and right cuneate fasciculus. Now it's important to note that axons from the lower body will enter the posterior column inferior to T6. Okay, inferior to T6. That's lower body. They will travel in a medial section of the column called the fasciculus gracilis, which you saw, and synapse in the gracile nucleus, so we're keeping the words the same, of the medulla oblongata. Axons from the upper body enter at or superior to T6, so T6 is our marker, and travel up a more lateral section called the fasciculus cuneatus and synapse in the cuneate nucleus of the medulla oblongata. Okay, so both of them are going to be headed towards the medulla oblongata. You just have to remember that axons from the lower body enter the posterior column inferior to T6, axons from the upper body enter the column. So here is just a recap from the medulla oblongata whenever we discuss this in the brain. Here you can actually see the gracile nucleus and the cuneate nucleus in the brain stem. And as you can see, these are going to relay the somatic information to the thalamus. So, from the cord up to the medulla, we have the names that are going to be consistent, gracile or cuneate, okay? Okay, so let's look at this entire pathway as a whole, okay? 
Remember, just like the other pathways, we always have to start with a sensory receptor in the periphery. In this particular instance, we are going to be picking up the sensations of fine touch, pressure, vibration, proprioception sensations from the right side of the body. So we're starting on the right side of the body just as we did with the other pathways. And I'm changing my pen color to green. I apologize, I meant to do that earlier. But remember, this is the posterior column pathway. So we're going to do green on this one. The key is the exact same for our first, second, and third neurons. We still have red, white, and black. So whenever we're looking at this particular area here, remember, regardless of which pathway it is, we have to go in through the dorsal root because that is where the sensory information is going to travel. Now, as we go in through the dorsal root, look and see what is immediately different from the spinal thalamic pathway. What happens is we go in and we ascend. We head towards those nucleuses in the medulla oblongata that you just saw a second ago. The spinal thalamic pathway, remember what we did was we immediately crossed over at that level of the spinal cord. That is not going to happen here. You are going to not cross over. Instead, you are going to ascend to get up into the medulla. Then, once in the medulla, in the specific nucleus, then will be the synapse with the second order neuron. And at that point, the second order neuron will then decussate over to the other side of the medulla. It will then continue to ascend through the midbrain and head up towards the thalamus. Again, the ventral nuclei in the thalamus. Now you can see I put a little note over here. The secondary neurons that start in the gracile and cuneate nucleus cross over to the other side of the medulla as internal arcuate fibers to form what we call the medial lemniscus. Sometimes this column, instead of being called the posterior column, it will also be referenced in textbooks as the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. So if you hear that terminology, that is what they are referencing, is those secondary neurons decussate in the medulla oblongata, and then they will ascend as the medial lemniscus up towards the ventral nuclei in the thalamus. And again, processing in the thalamus, because remember the thalamus is the one that will direct all sensory information. So the processing in the thalamus determines what perception or what sensation you're actually going to perceive because there's lots of options for this particular column, right? You've got fine touch, you've got vibration, etc. So it's the processing in the thalamus that will determine what are you actually going to sense. And of course then from there it is going to send it on to that primary somatosensory cortex like we saw earlier to reach our conscious awareness. So that is... Now this is just for those of you who like words. So whenever we're talking about the posterior column, just remember the first order travels ipsilaterally to the brainstem. Decusation does not occur until, what's the blank? The medulla oblongata, okay? Second order neurons synapse on third order neurons in the ventral nuclei, and it will be that thalamus that will help you with perceiving, was this a vibration, was this a fine touch, etc. Of course, then, it will be sent on to the primary somatosensory cortex or our homunculus. As we saw our homunculus guy earlier, remember, if it goes to the area of the hands, there's lots of receptors there. It's a highly sensitive place, whereas something like the foot has less receptors. Okay, so let's look at this true or false. If we're in the right dorsal column, so right dorsal column, we have a lesion here on the right hand side, L1 again, so we're still in the same spot, would we have 
ipsilateral loss of the sensations associated with the dorsal column. Is it going to be ipsilateral or is it going to be contralateral? Because the information does decussate, so what would it actually be? Okay, so if you thought about it for a second, it is going to be ipsilateral, and this is true because the decussation does not occur until you get to the brain stem. So therefore, since the information is going to travel on the same side until you get to the brain stem, remember that the brain stem is where it will cross over, then yes, a lesion on the right for the dorsal column pathway will cause an ipsilateral issue in the body. So right side lesion, right side problem for the leg because this is at L1. So yes, this is true. So here's a cool thing. Testing the posterior columns is um, kind of simple with one of the tests that we call Romberg's test. And I do this test pretty frequently in practice. Um, so I do like this test. The Romberg's test is testing proprioception. And proprioception, remember, is one of the sensations that is going to be carried in the posterior column. Now, Romberg's test lets us know that whenever we're looking at this, we have to have two of the three senses two of three senses in order to maintain balance while standing. Remember, for proprioception, it's all about where your body is at in space. So, if we have proprioception, vestibular function, using our internal ear to help us with our balance, and vision, which can let you know, of course, as you're looking straight ahead, you can keep your eyes focused on something to help kind of maintain your body position. If you have proprioception, vestibular function, and vision as three ways in order for you to maintain balance and not fall over, well, basically what we would do in Romberg's test is take away one of these, specifically vision, in order to see if that person can still maintain their balance by using their vestibular function, using their proprioception from their dorsal columns. So if we take away the vision, what we want to do is, as you can see this doctor right here is standing next to his patient as the doctor is standing next to the patient, look at what he's doing. Making sure that he has an arm in the front and an arm in the back in order to ensure that the patient is not going to fall over. Okay? Because if someone closes their eyes and we remove vision from their sensations in order to help them maintain their balance, it is possible that they may begin to sway and then fall. So if they lose their balance, then we would call this a positive Romberg's test known as sensory ataxia. So the sensory ataxia lets us know that this person has to have their vision in order for them to maintain their balance because there is something that is not correct within either the vestibular function or the posterior column pathway. So a loss of balance is a positive test this is known as sensory ataxia. So Romberg's test is pretty easy. That person should be able to stand there for 30 seconds without falling. If they cannot, then obviously if they lose their balance, they fall over whatever it is. That's the positive Romberg's test. Now, it's quite natural for some people to sway a little bit as they close their eyes. So if they sway slightly, whether that's medial lateral or anterior posterior, there could be something else going on inside of the system. Um, but a slight sway is commonly seen. We're really just looking for a loss of balance to say that it's a positive Romberg's test.
So why would this happen? As you can see here, I put a number of different reasons as to why there might be some sort of problem with the posterior column pathway that would lead to the positive Romberg's test and you know then the diagnosis of sensory ataxia. So I'm not going to read all of these for you, but of course you can see on here there's a number of different things. Um, that website that you see listed at the top, you can actually go there, read the entire report if you want to. So that way, if you want a little bit more in-depth information, then by all means, there it is for you. Now, of course, I put diet as number one. Um, well, they actually put diet as number one because this is just straight from that particular website. But whenever you look at diet, you do have to make sure that if you are going to do vegetarian, vegan, and not eat an any animal products whatsoever, that you're doing it in a very healthy way and you're not missing out on some of the nutrients that are absolutely essential for proper functioning of your nervous system, specifically that B12. Um, it's very commonly low in vegans and vegetarians, so ensuring that you're eating well-rounded and well-balanced, if that is what you're going to choose to do so that you do not cause any problems in your system. Okay, so that was posterior column everything on the dorsal side of the spinal cord. Remember, whenever we're looking at T6, that's an important landmark for us whenever it comes to our two different pathways. And then, of course, whenever we're looking at the decussation, remember that's going to occur in the medulla, which means a lesion on a particular side is going to cause an ipsilateral loss of sensation. Okay, now we're going to go into the third spinocerebellar pathway. Spinocerebellar pathway is, of course, going to be headed towards the cerebellum. And remember when we were in brain, we talked about how the cerebellum is important for fine-tuning those muscle movements and that muscle coordination. So we likened this to um, those highly trained athletes in the NFL and the NBA, etc. So the spinocerebellar pathway is going to convey the information about position of muscles, tendons, and joints from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. Muscles, tendons, and joints, everything that a high level athlete needs to work appropriately so that they can do their job. Now, the unique thing about the spinal cerebellar pathway is that this information is not going to reach our awareness. There is not a third order neuron in these pathways. If you remember from the spinal thalamic and the posterior column pathway, we had the third order neuron that always went to one particular part of the brain. There is not a third order neuron taking the info from the spinal cerebellar pathway to the what. What would be your fill in the blank in this particular case? Remember, third order neuron always goes to what? Somatosensory cortex on that postcentral gyrus in the brain. Okay, so it's not going to happen in this particular case. All right, so for our spinocerebellar tracts, we have the posterior and we have the anterior. For the posterior, make sure that you see here that the axons do not decussate, okay? They do not in the posterior tract. They will travel through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and then in the anterior tract, these are going to travel through the superior cerebellar peduncle. Now, for the anterior tract, there's a unique situation going on here. Many, many, but not all, of the axons will decussate twice. So they can decussate once in the spinal cord and then again in the cerebellum. If they decussate twice, then what that means is, is that ultimately the information ends up on the ipsilateral side because of the decussation twice. It would be contralateral if there was decussation once, but it's ipsilateral because of the decussation twice. Now that doesn't happen to all of them, so I'm gonna show you two different pictures, one where you will see 
that the axons do cross over twice and then one picture where you see that the anterior spinal cerebellar does not cross over. So let's look at that. Alright, so looking at our key again, first, second, third, what you will notice on this spinal cerebellar, no third. Remember this does not reach your conscious awareness. So on this particular picture right here, the picture from your book, what you can see is, of course, we start in the periphery with the receptor. Of course, we go in through the dorsal root, as we have said over and over and over and over again. Now, for this particular case, what you can see here is there's going to be a synapse in the posterior horn, and we're going to have a crossing over because this is the anterior tract. So, the crossing over, if we trace this up and we continue, you can see here that this is one that does not cross over twice. Okay, because not all of them cross over twice, remember? So, for our anterior that just crosses over once, then what you can see here is that we end up on the cerebellum on the opposite side of the body. So, whenever we're looking at where this information actually goes, it's going to the Purkinje cells of the cerebellar cortex, okay? So for your posterior tract, let's look at that one. And over here is where we're starting. Peripheral receptor, information is carried in through the first order, through the dorsal root. We have a synapse in the posterior horn there is no decussation in the posterior tract. So what happens is there will be ascension so that ultimately the information ends up in the cerebellum on the same side of the body as where the information originally came from because there was no decussation. Now over here in this particular picture, what you can see is See how we can trace this up and then we have basically these axons that are coming over here to the left side of the body. So on your left side receptor, ultimately you can have the synapse occurring in the posterior horn, the decussation immediately, information travels up and then it decussates back over again, okay? So it ends up on the ipsilateral side because of one decussation and then the second decussation. So that's how it ends up on the ipsilateral side, sometimes in the anterior tract. Just remember, the posterior tract does not decussate. So the posterior tract is going to start here and on this particular picture goes up and it ends here. Okay, headed towards those Purkinje cells within the cerebellum in order to convey that information from the Golgi tendon organs, the muscle spindles, and the joint capsule receptors that will give the information for proprioception. Okay, so that was somatic. Remember, when we say somatic, you want to think of your skeletal system or your skin, so all of the S's. Whenever we're looking at visceral, remember this is viscera, so this is organs. Now that's why I have it in yellow, so that it can be kind of like your visual indicator that we are switching over into something new. Spinal thalamic was red, posterior column was green, spinal cerebellar was purple. Now this visceral sensory information I put in yellow so that you would know we're no longer talking about the somatic information. Now we're going to be talking about primarily the organs within the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavities. Because these are internal organs, we're going to be talking about interoceptors. Remember interoceptors are those that are going to pick up information internally. And we went through this last time as we talked about the different types, whether the nociceptors that pick up pain, baroreceptors that pick up the um, changes in pressure, 
within organs, etc. And of course we said these are not as numerous as they are in. For our visceral sensory pathways, cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10 are going to be important cranial nerves to remember because these will carry sensory information from the mouth, the palate, the pharynx, which is of course the throat, the larynx, the voice box, the trachea, commonly known as windpipe, and the esophagus is of course your food tube. So whenever we're looking at these cranial nerves, they will be carrying the sensory information from these particular parts of the body. The posterior roots, remember, posterior is always sensory. Posterior roots of spinal nerves T1 through L2 will carry the visceral sensory information for all of those organs between the diaphragm and the pelvic cavity. And then if we're looking at S2 through S4, remember I told you guys S2, 3, 4, keep the pee and poo off the floor. For S2 through S4, think about inferior pelvic cavity, okay? So for our visceral sensory information, the axons of the first order neurons that are going to carry this information travel with the autonomic motor fibers innervating the same visceral structures. We haven't yet gotten into the autonomic nervous system pathways, so we'll be, we will be talking about this more later on. These first order neurons deliver the sensory information to second order interneurons whose axons ascend within the spinothalamic pathway. Remember that was our red pathway. So they're going to share. And then we have most of this information delivered to the solitary nucleus. So you want to remember the solitary nucleus. This is a large nucleus on each side of the medulla oblongata. It's a major processing and sorting center for this visceral sensory information. So visceral sensory, think solitary nucleus. And of course it has extensive connections with the cardiovascular and respiratory centers as well as the reticular formation because we are talking about organs and maintaining homeostasis with these internal organs. So here's a little picture for you where you can see your solitary nucleus and tract. Um, on this particular picture you can see those upper structures that we just kind of talked about earlier. Our esophagus, our trachea are right next to each other. Um, so you can't see the esophagus on this particular picture but it would be posterior to the trachea, the throat, the larynx, etc. So all of this visceral sensory information you can even see here one of the cranial nerves that we mentioned, cranial nerve 5, remember 5, 7, 9, and 10 are going to carry this information ultimately to the solitary nucleus in order for the processing in order to maintain homeostasis. All right, so last review. Let's see how you do with these questions. As a result of pressure on her spinal cord, Jill cannot feel fine touch or pressure on her lower limb. So let's think, what was it that told us about fine touch or pressure? Which tract is this that is being compressed? Hopefully you got the Gersow fasciculus, which is going to carry the information about touch and pressure. All right. Which one carries action potentials generated by nociceptors? So our pain receptors, which tract is going to do that? lateral spinothalamic. So go back to your red. Remember the lateral will carry pain and it also carries something else. Make sure you know what else it carries.
what hemisphere, cerebral hemisphere, receives impulses carried by the right gracile fasciculus? So which hemisphere? You know, we only have two options. It's either the right or the left. And what we're wanting to know is which one is going to receive the impulses carried by the right gracile fasciculus. So which pathway is the gracile fasciculus in? You got to know what's in the posterior column pathway. So now the question is, does the posterior column pathway decusate? And if it decusates, then we know we have our answer. So the left cerebral hemisphere is going to receive the impulses carried by the right gracile fasciculus because yes, it does decusate. Okay, remember the spinal thalamic decusates immediately. The posterior column pathway decusates in the medulla oblongata. There is some differences in the spinal cerebellar. So one of them does not decusate at all. Which one is that? One of them may decusate once or it may decusate twice. So which one is that? Okay, those are the types of questions you want to be asking yourself as you work through this information.